So uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Stefan Billinger. Uh, Stefan is uh, working uh, in social science in the SOD unit. Soot for that. It's not dark matter, so it's not soot. It stands for strategic organization design. Uh, Stefan has um, pushed forward a uh, lab at SDU, uh, SDU. So this lab serves a very different role than a laboratory in the uh, natural sciences. So it's not wet stuff, it's sit and dry land, and uh, it's not experimental stuff like the efficient label between experiments and theory. Rather, the role it serves is an integral part of theory development. So it's working at this theoretical unit um, that uses lab experiments to derive constraints on the theory. Um, he has pioneered this lab at our university and it will serve also in the future a very, very uh, important function in, uh, in actually extracting uh, behavioral regularities that we then can plug into our theories. One more thing though, in behavioral economics, this is uh, commonly done. What's what he is doing and what's different in this field uh, is basically that you want both the individual and the aggregate in a controlled sense, that is some organizational level uh, extraction. This is much more complicated than it sounds because when these people bump into each other, it's not like your fundamental particles, it's basically they have ideas, they have cognition and all that. So tracing and controlling for these things, both at the individual and the organization level, is the challenge, and that is promising also to push uh, this uh, line of research forward. So um, with this brief, very brief introduction, Stephen, floor is yours, and we very much look forward to, to listening to, to, to your lecture. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Walker. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, and good morning to everyone, and I'm very proud to um, present here in the BS series, seminar series, um, some of the work that I have been doing here at SDU for quite a few years. Now, the title of the topic is How People Solve Complex Problems, Lessons from the Lab. And uh, as Torben already pointed out, I'm a member in the strategic organization design group, that is, my core concern is not only how does the organization work. Now, here I on purpose put in people um, because what we realized when we started the lab is that directly jumping to the organization is too quick. We need a solid individual level by baseline before we introduce organization, before we have experiments with several people with organizational structures, with organizational incentives, etc. So what I'm doing today is introducing results that we have for the individuals, for the people. There's a little bit of what happens when we introduce the organization, but I guess that would be another talk, possibly at some point in the future. Now, when I say complex problems, um, I figured I need a good motivation, so also our physicists are interested in what we're actually doing here. And I was thinking what makes problems actually complex, and I found this one. <laughs> what is that? Like standard model. Standard model, standard model of course. Um, I guess we can Resist agree model. that this is complex, problem. right? This is certainly complex. And it points to a really important aspect that we have in all of um, the social sciences as well. That if we want to properly understand something, there's lots and lots of variables. And guess what? The majority of them are interdependent to some degree. Now, our motivation here is how do we actually, how do individuals solve these problems? That would be ideal to understand that, but we scale it down and go basically to the core, or what we think is the core, for understanding and exploring how people go about solving these types of problems. So what is the key ingredient that we start to work with is interdependencies and how they determine complexity. Interdependencies, here I'm back to my organization, 
scientist uh, perspective, we find in most organizations, there's lots of examples similar to the physicists as well, right? interdependencies in organizational charts. Look at the chart of the university, we see lots of interdependencies. Or also when people make strategic choices, we see interdependencies. The important point is that independencies produce complexities. And um, they end up being challenging for whoever has to deal with um, these complexities. So we use the NK model to understand um, human problem solving and uh, more broadly. And what the NK model is, I'd like to explain here. It's by the end of the day, our uh, going back to our definition of complexity, <coughs> namely that complexity can be defined as the number of items or parts you have in a systems and the number of interdependencies that you have between these parts. The number of parts in the system is n, the interdependencies between those is k. Um, and there's lots of examples, right? Uh, books in the library, number of employees, maybe n. But how you tell people to work with each other and who you talk, tell to work with whom, that creates interdependencies and that, depend, and that creates the complexity that the organization would need to work with. So we have lots of examples for that. And the combinations of N and K result basically in different environments and different landscapes with different complexities. Now, if we think about complexities and put it in a different context, we can argue that low complexities would be situations like Mount Fuji uh, K0, there's no interdependencies concerning, um, let's say, someone who's hiking in that terrain. When there's no fog, perfect weather, we know exactly where the maximum is, we know exactly which direction we need to go. It's quite clear which type of behavior we need to display or have in order to get to the top of the mountain, right? It's hill climbing. Wherever it goes up, that's exactly our path. If we contrast that with a high complexity landscape, right? where is the peak here? And the traditional hill climbing doesn't work anymore. Here it's clear. Whenever it goes up, that's the direction. Here, well, first of all, I don't know where the peak is. Second, if I'm somewhere on some lower peak, I will definitely need to go downhill before I will be able to go uphill again. That's a different type of search behavior. It's a different type of going about complexity. With our model, with our um, experiments, we exactly tap into that and exactly try to study that. That is also prevalent in management. And I used an example from Michael Porter, who's a, who was a big name in management research in the last century. Maybe some uh, non-management scholars also know the name. He basically already pointed out that the strategy of a firm is a vector of the firm's choices with respect to its major decision variables and how they're interdependent. And this is an old example, but it neatly points to how this is also relevant in the context of, um, let's say, a low cost um, airline, right? This is Southwest. The slogan back then was the low fare airline. Make sure we get people around the globe for cheap money. That means very low ticket prices. That we can only have with high aircraft utilization. That means we have short haul, point-to-point -point routes between mid-sized cities and secondary airports. If we want to realize that, we need limited passenger services. We have frequent reliable departures. We have a lean, highly productive ground and gate In order to have these core components of the strategy up and running, we need these other um, components, these other parts of the, of the strategy also to work, right? Automatic tech ticket machines, um, limited use of travel agent. We have a standardized fleet with only 737 aircrafts. We have a 15 minute gate return around. We have no seat assignments, no meals. Clean decisions that basically in the airline industry determines up to today what's going on on the industry level and also what makes individual firms in the industry competitive today. 
They figured that one out in the 70s. Southwest was the first who did that. You know, everyone is doing that now. EasyJet, Ryanair, and the such. Right? The basic logic of that activity system still holds, and we still know there's a certain amount of key decisions that need to be in place, supported by other decisions, that will eventually lead to the strategy that then becomes successful over longer periods of time. Now, in management, these interdependencies that we have here between these different bubbles, well, they occur in R&D teams, in production processes, but also in firms interact with suppliers, with buyers, stakeholders, you name it. We also know the more interdependencies there are, the more rough the landscape. Again, we are not in the Mount Fuji context, here than in the Alps. We do need to realize that high, uh, simple hill climbing, climbing a strategy would not get us to the top. So if the big challenge for most managers, but I would in general even say for most people who face complex problems is that you actually don't know which landscape you're in. What do you do? Most complex problems that society societies are facing today occur in landscapes and occur in environments where we don't really know the end and we don't really know the K. How do we search in these type of environments? That's the core of this particular research agenda. So we look at search in complex landscape, and we also need, on top of the complexity issue, realize that any type of human actor who is searching in that type of context obviously is facing bounded rationality. Bound rationality meaning that we all have limited um, cognitive abilities, cognitive capacities. We have, whenever we make decisions, typically limited information is available. And finally, in decision making, we typically face limited time. Now, given bound rationality, given the complexity of the complex landscape, how do people search? And the key insight that we had when studying this um, was that search in these type of environments can be conceptualized as a combinatorial multi-attribute decision making. Now what is that? Why should we study this combinatorial multi-attribute decision making? Well, in organizations, again, we've seen interdependence are, are really essential. And we have out there a lot of consultants, there's a whole industry around it, that gives managerial advice that basically very often ignores the complexities of the task environment. That is um, uh, the consideration of the fundamental underlying logic that we start to develop here um, that is very often not um, considered um, in these type of contexts. But and that was surprising for us when we started to work on this, um, basically putting the model in the lab um, several years ago. We actually um, were only thinking about organizations. And when thinking about it, we realized that many of the underlying um, factors that we were looking at are also prevalent in general. And when we started then to develop the, the experiment, we got approached by cognitive psychologists, social psychologists, <laughs> political scientists, economists, who realized that this underlying model and what we are developing here, that that is of broader appeal, not only to our own field, but also other fields. So interdependencies are essential for social interactions, was the underlying reason why this got more attention and more people got attracted to this. The, real, the, the reason for that, again, is Many real world situations require individuals or groups to change several decision criteria at the same time. And that goes back to the core of what is combinatorial multi attribute decision making. Remember, I had the chart from Southwest with lots of different decisions that they had to take. So ultimately, these are individual decisions and what an organization, but also many individuals that face many decision criteria where they can say, well, do I go 
this way or do I go this way? We face a situation that we need to make a set of decisions and at the end we have a sum as the performance outcome. Right? We cannot observe what is, let's say, this is point one, this is point two, point one, point five. We cannot observe the, perf the individual performance of these decision criteria, but we can only observe the sum of all. But yet, when we are confronted with optimizing this system, or just find maximize performance in here, we always make choices where we have multiple decision criteria. That is, multiple combinatorial, multi-attribute decision making is at the core here. And um, uh, interestingly, when I started to talk about this with um, uh, psychologists, they haven't considered that yet. So there was no experiment out there that would exactly tap into this aspect of decision making and problem solving, even though I would argue it's at the core of what um, a lot of um, so, sorry, can I ask, I mean, what, what, is actually, what, what you want to optimize? I mean, what is actually the variable you want the to optimize? The position. So the position in the land landscape, okay. ultimately. So, so have this is very general. This doesn't have to apply only to, uh, to social sciences, so it can be actually basic In principle, everywhere, yes. The idea is, if we have an end tape, this is a slide from Thank you. If you have an N10 K0 landscape, that is the Mount Fuji, um, then, we, um, then we have a situation where N10 means 1,024 uh, choices if we accept that all of these are binary choices. Right? Um, 2 to the power of 10 is 1,024. So what we have here basically is a bit string with 10 decisions, they can either be 0 and 1, it's the same that we have here. And um, if we define that the P, the global P in that landscape is 1, then we can basically rank all configurations um, accordingly. And what we see is, if we're at the top, if we're, let's say, close to the top, we only need to change one of the bits in order to get to the very top, right? It's only one change that we need to make in the whole um, um, in, in, in the whole bit string, right? Now, if we have the same amount of decision variables, 10 again, but k goes up, let's say, to 9, it looks like this. Again, 10, uh, the the top is defined with a performance of one, but if you are very close to the top, but not quite there yet, in order to get to the top, you need in this context to change five different decision variables. And now you can see where the big issue lies, right? Um, how should I identify, or how should someone who is confronted with a complex problem in this context identify that exactly these five need to be switched in order to get to the top. Again, people who are already performing very well are facing a situation where it is very, very hard to improve. Just trying out one at a time is not going to do the trick. Now, the big challenge is how do people get up there and how do people um, actually search in a context that basically has this as the underlying model. So the question is, how do humans search in an NK landscape? And the big question is, do I change just one bit at a time, or do I change many of these bits at a time? That is the big question. And um, from this example, we've seen that local search, it beats radical adaptation when complexity is low, that is when there's few interdependencies. But we also have seen whenever the complexity goes up, we need to make radical changes in order to keep on improving. Now, the big issue here is that in an ideal world, we would simply check out all the different options, right? But if we have 10, I already told you, we have 1,024 
um, um, different possible choices. So if I, we wanted to check out all of them, do basically exhaustive search, and checking out one of them would just take a second, it already takes 17 minutes. Now, we know from real world problems that the end is much higher, right? Um, I actually did that exercise once with an MBA class, asking them, how many core problems do you face? And they came up with numbers between 20 and 30. They were able to rank them and list them and come up with a, a nice view on those, but it was also clear they would not be able to solve all of those in a second, right? They would need hours, days, perhaps years. And you can see, checking out everything, time explodes. It's simply not possible. Right? So in that context, um, we decided to develop a lab experiment that allows us to basically um, test what people are actually doing. And the interesting insight here was that um, <coughs> Lab experiments at that time um, were really a neglected area in management research. It changes now, but here's just a little um, point. In the top journals in our field, all, between 2010 and 2015, only about 8% of all papers are experimental field papers. So that was quite um, interesting insight. And uh, it led us also to the conclusion that we need more of those experiments basically to be able to rigorously isolate mechanisms and then test uh, how they alter our dependent variables of choice. So in that context, we developed the alien game. And um, the alien game basically says um, it gives individuals the task to develop art for aliens, aliens they have never seen before, <laughs> aliens they don't know, they do not know any type of art preferences of the alien, and the task is to develop now, um, yeah, products, sell products to the alien. It's also known that the alien likes 10 different artsy features, these are graphical symbols, and, the, and it's then up to the individual who's in the lab to basically start to configure and reconfigure the choices in that N10 bit string. Now what we change is different levels of K. And then we see how many changes do people make from one round to the next? And what is this, what we call search distance that people engage in? For these experiments, we have various goals, various incentives. We pay people based on tournament, we pay people based on the uh, performance they have here. Okay, then, based, yeah, I'll tell you more on that later. The interesting thing is we developed that uh, alien game um, uh, here at, at SDU, and it was maybe five, six years ago, it was up and running, and it's meanwhile adopted by, I, I know, five research Very teams successful. that are now using it around the globe, and there's many more who send emails and want to know more about it. So it's really a nice little feature that came out of our group and that is now getting some traction and becoming more and more prominent, not only in our field, but also in other fields. Um, I'll show you some basic results. What we see is that if we put individuals in the worst performing position at the beginning, we don't tell them that, of course, they manage to improve, right? They figure out how to get to better position. So if they have 24 trials, at the end they have, if you look at K0, most people actually, more than half, reach the global peak, and we have quite a good performance. The moment we increase K, people are not that good anymore. It's also what we would expect. Um, Stevens, uh, could you tell a little bit how they play again? to get an idea of that? How they play the game? Yeah. Well, they're basically confront. I don't have a screenshot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they basically phase um, 10 decisions, and then they need to click on each of them, do I have zero or one? Basically, do I want to have a particular graphical symbol to be displayed, yes or no? You make that for all 10 decisions. You then say submit, 
the alien evaluates it, and you get as return the performance. Computer game. Basically. It's a computer game by the end of the day. Um, Can I also ask? Yes. How are these uh, in the model? What are these? I mean, these interdependencies. K. How are they implemented? Um, what we do is that we create. Uh, with a computer, um, we create 1,024 combinations, and that's then our landscape based on a K that we defined in advance. And then people basically make their choices. They have a particular configuration. Then we go in our 1,024 combination library and look up what is the performance value. And that's the performance value that we then display to the people. But, but concretely, I mean, a K non-zero, does that mean that if I change a bit, then there will also be a change in some other bit? Yeah. Yes. That, that's what it means. But I don't, I don't see yeah, where yeah, they, the changes. They don't, right? no, 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 they don't. I yeah, only sure. see the final outcome. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But that's what the... And the moment K goes up, there will be more of these yeah. changes, right? Yeah. So, they, so basically, as they proceed, they train themselves to get yes. closer. But as K is larger, it gets progressively harder for them to actually uh, yes. learn and because, again, alien game, the, the idea here is you start at zero. Many real world problems that's, um, have the problem that when you, fail, when you give them to people, people have some idea of how to solve the problem. And they grab from various areas to basically start um, solving a problem. Now that is important and that's relevant in many contexts, but for our theoretical understanding of human problem solving, it is important uh, to start at prior knowledge equals zero. Basically, uh, in a situation where people don't know anything. With the alien game, I think you're close to that situation. And as you also see, initially, people are really good at figuring out um, how to improve, right? Which is not surprising if you're in the lowest position possible in that or in the landscape. Even uh, these are averages or averages. approximately how many? Um, oh. Just rough numbers. In total, we have now not only at this university but globally um, ran experiments with several thousand, mm -hmm. uh, two to three thousand subjects um, uh, in Africa, in Asia, in the US, you name it. We have meanwhile data around the globe. And the baseline that I show here is always the same. So I'm guessing, I mean, maybe this comes up on the averaging, but your score is your best score, right? Yes, yes, the best score you ever yeah. achieved, yes. Is that a critical K? It seems to be that from five and nine, there's no much of an yes. We thought there would be a big, bigger one, and I have now a landscapes where we only use K one or two, and then we see more differences. <laughs> it is surprising already that once you hit three, four, many of our uh, participants are basically saying yeah. they improve, but if, it, if they face K4 or 9, it doesn't really matter. And if you're going higher and I'm going to trials, it doesn't help. Right? Um, if, I ran it also with 100. Yeah. It further improves, but there's not much. Like so the majority of the story we see here. So you can get up to 80% Let's look at the search distance. That is basically those numbers of changes that you make here in comparison to the best performing we have so far. And we can see that people change on average 2 to 2.5. And that is also robust, by the way. That is, um, luckily, I have already um, now other people who have adopted this, uh, the, the game or developed a very similar game. We all find search distance equal to the plus minus a little bit. It's, it's really a very robust finding. Sorry, can you tell me what is the search distance again? What is the search distance definition? Two. That's the number of changes you make ah, okay. on average from one to the next round or the next trial. No, it's right, it's hamming distance. It's hamming distance, yes. yes. So, so this is a fairly a robust finding. And um, for our existing models in management, this is already somewhat surprising because many people assume in their modeling uh, one, change one at a time, which is then referred to as local search. Now, in our first paper that we got out, 
we further explored that search distance, and what we found is, now here on the y-axis, I have search distance at time t. Here I have search distance at time t minus 1. That is, how many changes did I make in the prior round compared to how many changes do I make now? And what we split here, oh, I, this is cut away here. <laughs> the green one is, have I experienced, uh, the green and blue distinction is the question of, have I experienced success or failure? Uh, did my performance go up or down? And what we see here is, if we have success, that's the green one, I basically reduce my search distance. If I face failure, I increase my search distance. Again, if I wasn't successful, I become more exploitative. I start searching in my small neighborhood. If I'm facing failure, I increase my search distance. I become more exploratory. We also then um, we calibrated um, um, a model that basically um, used our real-world data and um, put that idea that we have narrowing search distances with success and basically widening search distances with failure um, and put them uh, here in a model on adaptive search and that basically captures exactly that. What is the delta between what I've achieved now my prior achievement, if it's positive, um, yeah, it goes up or down. Now, um, the core insight here is basically a tension of human search behavior between failure-induced exploration and success-induced exploitation. And that already has some implications, particularly for managers who are, for instance, setting targets. Um, Easy targets will probably foster exploitation. Difficult targets are likely to foster some exploration and risk taking. Another case study. We also further push that and basically compare it to the baseline that we have in our field that is the local search, where you make one change at a time, right? not two changes, or in our adaptive search, it will be a little bit above. And we put basically computational agents. In, the, um, um, in different landscapes. This is N10 with K3, K9, N50 with K15, and K45. And what we see here is that the local search, the traditional algorithm that our field uses, it certainly does well here in N50, K15, but for instance, it does not do as well in N10 and K9. This one is a little bit undecided in 50K45. But the most interesting thing, I think, is this one, N10K3. We see that local search is above adaptive search up until trial, maybe 80, and then it changes. And that is directly talking to our exploration exploitation trade off that is a big thing in uh, management research um, because they typically say first explore, then exploit. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a trade off in the title of that. It becomes a trade 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 off now uh, and on, on for, for the following slides. Yeah. Our study's application is first explore, exploit depends on the environment, the K and the N, right? And we have found at least a, one case where you first want to exploit and then explore, which basically uh, turns around conventional wisdom that we have in our field. And um, um, that's basically one of the so major so indications so we have. When the mean you first exploit and then explore, I mean, how do you So explain? if you're in a, in a um, depending on which in the environment you you are in, it may make sense to first look for um, um, uh, well-performing neighboring um, uh, um, positions in the landscape before you <coughs> consider making the big jumps, basically going to other areas. changing the main yes. yeah. So, so it's, 
one should not underestimate the power of uh, neighborhood games um, um, that is basically the core story. Now, in all of these slides that I've shown so far, people were basically paid based on the best performance that they've achieved during those 24 rounds. What we changed then is saying, you will be paid based on the accumulated payoff. That means every round counts. And that's also, again, what most firms and organizations would be confronted with, right? You make a change, well, you wait a month, and then you make the next change, and you wait a month, and all of these rounds count, right? Every investor will, at the end of the quarter, want to see what is the outcome, and each, each day counts, right? You cannot do, you cannot always go back to the best performing um, configuration you have before. Now, when we did that, we realized that people simply started to stop, right? They made changes to up until some point, and then they stopped. Clean stopping after our 24 trials, uh, less than 30% of the people are still searching. The rest has simply stopped. <coughs> and that led us to think more thoroughly about what is that exploration exploitation trade off. And um, we discovered that there is a conceptual argument that hasn't been really put, put forward, neither in our field nor in psychology, that basically compares whether to search and where to search. It's a, the exploration exploitation trade off is, at its core, a two stage decision. The first one is do I improve my status quo? If I'm satisfied with what I have, I don't make any changes, I simply stick where I am. Only if I choose to change, then I'm confronted with the question, how many changes do I make? So it's a clean two-stage process. And when you look up the literature in the field, um, there's different notions of exploration. Um, the role of exploration is different. And also the role of feedback is, is quite different. Um, so we started to develop a paper around this notion and uh, experiments around it. And thought about what would be good ways to study this in the lab. And we realized the role of aspirations is important and the role of feedback is particularly important. So whether and where to search requires knowledge concerning what do individuals want to achieve <coughs> and when and how do they satisfy so When do they stop exploring? And there we, again, uh, developed um, uh, independent variables. One is straightforward. Again, K, we know makes a big difference in most of the studies. So we um, decided to look at K. And the other one was a new treatment. We ask students um, to deliberately formulate their aspirations. So in each trial, we basically ask them, what, what would be a good performance if you were to achieve it at some point in the future? So we basically ask them to formalize and write down on a piece of paper in each round, what do you think would be a good performance? So we have these different independent variables, complexity, and what we call deliberate aspiration formulation. And um, we implemented a two-stage model, regression model, where the first stage is a profit analysis, and the second one is a Poisson. And uh, I don't want to go through all the details. I only really realize time is running. But um, what we clearly see is success. Whenever you're successful, it reduces the likelihood of stopping. Your prior search distance, if you search broadly, it reduces the likelihood of stopping. Um, if you're already wealthy, that's prior wealth, it increases the likelihood of stopping. If you have a lot of unsuccessful tries in the last in the past, it uh, increases the likelihood of stopping. And then we have variables that were quite interesting that emerged in that um, analysis, and we call it the anchor. That is, after the first three trials, um, that performance that we had, the initial first feedback, that basically is significant. 
in, in, in most of these regressions. And it clearly shows if you have a high anchor, if your initial feedback was high, the likelihood of stopping also goes down. Now in our treatment where we had deliberate aspiration formulation, we were also looking at what were the aspirations after three trials, right? So actual performance versus the aspirations. And again, if your aspirations are high in that early stage, the likelihood of stopping um, um, increases, um, no, decreases. And aspiration um, in prior trial has also a negative um, um, sign here. So um, um, that's the first stage. The second stage um, is the Poisson regression, where we look at the number of changes being made, or people made. And here we saw that, um, again, um, some of the variables, um, uh, some of the variables basically show that that showed positive signs here, have negative signs here, and uh, we have some sign flips there. So here um, we have a clear um, um, evidence that the decision whether to search and where to search um, is basically driven by different feedback variables and um, leads to different outcomes. We also further looked at uh, performance that is how well were they doing at the end um, of that search? And there we saw that the aspirations that they formulated were non-significant, which we thought was an important insight. Uh, we find that, again, the anchor after trial, if you have a high anchor in trial three, it improves your performance. If you have number of active search trials, is an inverted U-shape that is up to a certain point um, being active in the search process improves your performance, then it reduces it. Complexity obviously reduces performance, and again, aspiration levels after trial number three um, are non significant. So, the takeaway from this study is that the inconsistent conceptions of what the basic exploration trade off is, we think we have found some points there, and the recommendations that we have out there in the field are very often around anti-dexterity that ignores that basic conceptual um, argument. What does ambidexterity mean? Ambidexterity in our context in management research means that the majority of firms need to do both. Um, um, well, that is what many argue. You need to explore and you need to exploit at the same time. And balancing both would be the challenge that firms are facing. So we, um, in this study, show these different types of exploration, exploitation, stopping versus broadening or narrowing search. And what we see here is that uh, how the aspirations develop based on different types of feedback is critical for the search behavior, but not necessarily performance. Sorry, by the feedback you mean, for example, feedback from the market, the feedback in, from Here the, in this context, yeah. it is feedback Initial rounds versus, for instance, in media. Like, but in a, real, in a real world, would that yeah. be feedback from the market? It would be feedback from, from the market, yes. Okay. So whether, you know, was up according to what's going on with Trump now, mm -hmm. in outstanding success. Yes, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. We also pushed this a little bit further, and because lots of psychologists were actually telling us that um, it. If you're good in this environment, heavily depends on how, um, how, how smart people are, what the IQ is. I'm just, I'm just curious about the general application of these kinds of results. I mean, so, I mean, basically the rough conclusion is just, uh, you know, common sense, no? I mean, uh, and the, mo the precision of the models for any given situation, is that so high that you can actually use it in a, you know, I mean, to make a more kind of like a quantitative decision based on a model like this, or? What do you mean? Quantitative decisions. I mean, what? I mean the general con uh, conclusion that you need to both, you know, explore global consequences of your decision and, and learn mm -hmm. from the those nearby is kind of like obvious, right? Mm -hmm. So, so to make a model like this, I guess the advantage would be that you can make it more quantitative. So you can actually model, and you know, make the, your decision uh, even better than than what you would do on an intuitive uh, level, right? 
And, uh, but then, it, then to do that, the model actually needs to be very precise on the, on the given situation. And, you know, you need to go beyond, I guess, the so I, would, I would argue that some of the insights may be obvious and for the casual layman observer be a straightforward argument. But what we are developing here is the conceptual and theoretical basis for basically fine tuning. For, for understanding. So, so, so you think that you will be able to make models that are precise to any given kind of the ideally, problem? Ideally, and then be able to go beyond the precision you could do by just intuitive uh, Ideally, you will have a predictive model at the end that um, mirrors what we see out there in the world. But the advantage of this approach is we then have, hopefully, a good understanding why what we see out there so I'm, I'm just curious, I mean, because I'm, I'm not in this field, so I'm just curious about, I mean, how, how much you can do with this. I mean, so, so are you saying that um, that you already now have a model that when you test it against uh, my common sense, mm -hmm. then that wins over me in some complex business situation? It wins over you, and it will create um, non-intuitive findings that you would normally not get. And, and you already have that model? Yes. Okay. And you're going to talk about now? No, no. I already showed some oh, different this, things, right? This alien model? Well, this one for 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 instance. So so that was uh, that was this not clear to me because that's a very I mean this was this alien game, right? Yes. It's but that's a very simplified model, right? Yes. So in a given real situation it's a very mm -hmm. complex uh, thing and so to make a model that really uh, mimics that uh, actual situation. Mm -hmm. I guess that this alien game is not uh, sufficiently precise. So to make a model, be. it can be. It's 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 mm -hmm. a model for the lab, for developing theory and for develop and for understanding um, how what is the functioning of the underlying mechanisms that we then see in the. But real I could world. imagine that in a real complex situation, all kind of factors that you have <coughs> included in this model will play and say there could be a punishment for change to for, for every change you make, for instance. Uh, that is not impo in incorporated into this alien oh, model. Oh, no, this is exactly it. You come up now with this idea. Let's punish people in each round. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we did when we basically introduced search costs. Each individual mm -hmm. round okay, enough, yeah. works, right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we're doing now, basically, by, basic, uh, by um, using our baseline. And whenever someone comes up with a new idea, we simply put it in the lab. So some people said, um, oh, this, what you're doing there heavily correlates with how smart people are. You should test, you should control for the IQ. Well, we did that. We did the Raven test, which is not the IQ, but it's a proxy. And uh, we got the results, right? We can now check that. We can test that. Mm -hmm. And here we see um, highly significant Raven results. And the higher your analytical skills are, the lower your performance. What's your guess? What's, what's your guess? Like, why is that the case? Well, is this the performance in the in the first setup the or the final, one where you have the, the final cumulative of the variant? So you should hire monkeys as a uh, as no. directors or no. <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm not saying that. Can I ask you yes. a question for the first one, the mm -hmm. second one, which I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. In the first one, I think we would, success made it less likely that you, I mean, you, you, were, you were reducing or stopping yes. your search, yes. right? Basically. Yes. But in the second one, that was not the case, or, or did I understand it correctly? In what do you mean? In the second one, you did in not the second stage? The, the so in the setup where you had the, where, where they were going for mm -hmm. the cumulative, and you had to yes. decide both whether or where. Yes. Mm -hmm. but what did, I didn't fully understand, I think I wanted to ask before. What did success imply in that one? So in success, it's the same thing again. So also, the, the uh, success-induced exploitation and failure-induced exploration okay, still, still holds when we introduce these search costs. Yeah. It's okay. still the same model. Okay. Yes. So, so, so for I mean, I'm just still curious about the applicability of this. I mean, just because I, I, I so I mean, um, so if I make a, if I have a complex situation, I need to to model this, okay? And you say, okay, I can model this, and I have some parameters that I need to introduce to model this complex situation. 
of course, uh, it is very complex. It's very hard to know what is the, the parameters that I should introduce to model the situations. So I actually need to have data. So I actually need, you know, so I, 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 can, only I can only know what is the right model by having the answer of what is the optimal, uh, you know, what is the answer basically for that particular model. So in order to apply it, I then need to have a repetitive the experiment, right? I then need to have a different system that acts in exactly the same way in order to use the experience I have from making a model of the first system to make decisions of the second system. Yeah. But are there any two complex systems in the real world, in financial world or whatever world you are you're dealing with, that are so the same that you can actually use the model that you taught yourself by looking at one system and apply it to a different system? Well, for the great majority of problems in the social science, uh, we will never have never be in a position to have a one-to-one -one perfect mirror, right? right. These are proxies. Right. They tap into particular aspects of behavior, but, but then I'm particular just wondering mechanisms, yeah. and I test those, right? So, so this is the approach that is quite commonly used in psychology or in um, behavioral economics as well, where we try to understand what are, by the end of the day, cause and mechanisms that we as a society but, but, can work with. Yeah, so there it comes that again, because you want to use this model now to, 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 to I help want to you make a decision on a different this system. Point, right? At this point, I want to understand, use this model to basically understand mechanisms that people in organizations work with. Okay, so you're not, you're, not, you're, you're, not, you're not interested in making a, a, a model that you can use to, to help business leaders making decisions in the real world. That's not what you're after. You're only after that understanding the underlying uh, the psychological factors. That, that may be an outcome. So I'm teaching actually this to MBA students, mm -hmm. uh, our, our flexible MBA. These are people, mm -hmm. mid-40s to 50s, middle managers, senior mm -hmm. managers. They find this very useful because it gives them some, some underlying mechanisms to work with, uh, an understanding concerning underlying mechanisms which they haven't had before. So the one-to-one -one mirroring to what happens in their daily life, I don't have here. But I can make clear claims concerning what happens if I implement, for instance, different incentive systems. So, so, so right? if we start just sure. on this discussion, so, yeah, sure, so in a way, sure. yeah. uh, I think we understand what you're doing, and uh, that's fantastic, uh, because you uh, extract uh, the underlying mechanism, mm -hmm. what's at work here, mm -hmm. Immediately follows who should you hire, not perhaps the most clever guys. Interesting result. This question is a very, very different one, and the answer to that one is basically two. Either <coughs> a bootstrap, some kind of bootstrap mechanism, when you can plug this in, or the other one is basically uh, test whether the, the uh, correspondence of spaces uh, is sufficient. That's, and he doesn't do that yet, mm -hmm. but somebody might want to do that. Also, uh, a little comment, additional comment. Um, several people have put this, this model and the underlying mechanisms already in the real world. But the title of this talk is Lessons from the Lab. Sure, sure. So no, this I'm is not why, the, no, 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 I'm, no, no, I'm no, not, not uh, questioning your talk. I'm just no, no, no. curious about what I'm the, saying the, is yeah, you, you have valid points, mm -hmm. but that mm -hmm. at least parts of this I cannot answer in the context of what I'm presenting. Yeah. But we, we can take no, no, a I mean, discussion I mean, offline yeah, sure. because it is an important one and there's, there's, there's different ways of going about this. I'd like to finish the talk and the, the coming back to this question which is do analytical skills improve search? They don't and the reason is people don't know when to stop. Very simple. So you, don't, you need to hire people who are smart at stopping at the right point. Right? Um, they simply forget to study, uh, to, to, to stop. And that, again, it provides us indicators for organizing innovation or, for instance, entrepreneurial behavior. Sorry, and you're saying the stop, the for stop of what? The stop uh, at improving or? Um... Stop searching. Stop searching. Don't okay. Know. okay. They don't know when to stop, stop searching. Um, I said I also give you a little bit of an idea of what we're doing um, in the context of putting this one in an organization, the first thing you would do is not have one person search the landscape, but to have two. Again, this opens a completely new um, line of argument that would be another talk. Uh, but what we see is the basic findings are again the same. We have adaptive search, and we find particularly 
interdependencies and types of interdependencies of particular interest, right? Action interdependencies, task interdependencies, <coughs> goal interdependency. These are, by the way, mechanisms that that managers work with on a daily basis. When they, they on a daily basis decide who's working with whom, who needs to report to whom, and what type of goals do I give people. And here we find its first insights. Uh, benefits of the team seem to be inherent in how the team searching, on, on, on how team search is organized. So there seems to be over and above competence of the individual and experience of the individual, there seems to be a benefit for organizing in particular ways. So what we will be able, hopefully, with this one is ideally to identify stereotypical forms of organizing, which will lead to particular outcomes that would then, again, have direct implications also for um, the practically oriented manager. So I'd like to summarize. What are the lessons from the lab, the core um, topic of this talk? We would argue that combinatorial multi-attribute decision-making is critical for problem solving in complex environments. It's relevant for organizations, but it is certainly also relevant for much of social interaction that we find in society. We have found an, a model that mirrors that we have an experimental paradigm that basically um, allows us to study that in many contexts. And as we move ahead, at the moment, some aspects of this may be um, a, a clean laboratory um, type of, of study, but we already move in directions where quite a few of these aspects have uh, direct implications for everyone who is solving complex problems. We also, through this line of work, develop an, a, a better understanding of behavioral regularities and irregularities uh, that basically helps us ultimately also hopefully to better understand why do people certain things, how do people uh, certain things, and how can we as society organize those people in a hopefully better way. Thank you very much. So, thank, thanks a lot, Stefan, uh, for this talk. Uh, we had quite a lot of uh, back and forth, uh, so thank you so much for that. There may be one or two more questions or comments, or, yeah. Yeah, I have just a question about this alien game. Is it still alive, and how yeah. can I, for example, find it? Google or I try to Google it. It gives some other results. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, science at Science at Home, um, um, which is a platform by Aarhus University, we are coming out to develop a platform where you can actually Very play nice. it. So, so there's an online source that, that offers you access to it. But I checked yesterday; it's offline at the moment. It was online until recently, and I think they will put it online uh, again um, very soon. Um, yeah, there's at the moment there's no direct access now, but um, I, I mean at the moment right now. But um, I would think that I also know from other co-authors and um, collaborators that there will be various sources and there are various places where you will be able to play. Okay. So, so that connects actually science at home to the uh, idea that, uh, of citizen science, crowdsourcing, that is another uh, emerging, rapidly emerging field where you use uh, common uh, citizens to solve difficult problems. It turns out that citizens can beat computers straight out in the class of problems that has to do with identifying the domains. Once the domain has been here, I, roughly, I mean, this is a very broad characterization, and uh, once the domain has been uh, identified, okay, bye-bye human, then the machine will work. But uh, it might be an idea actually also to put this up here, uh, since people are having it. Yeah, okay. so, uh, For example, I mean, I was thinking, I, I, I actually love it, so it's very nice. Uh, and it, this is a part that one will do, and I just put the standard model to start with, right? So we don't really know what the answer is. About 24 trials mm -hmm. to get to the standard model. Huh. Think about yeah. <laughs> hundreds, I mean, uh, several thousands of years to get there. Of course, <laughs> nature has also developed for most of that. And, and 
I don't think yeah. anybody could ever come up with yeah. a standard model, not even basically 70 years ago. I mean, it was, uh, mm -hmm. Currently, we actually know that it cannot be the old truth in any case, and yet we don't have anything. And it struck me that, you know, especially in moments where nature doesn't help us, right? Mm -hmm. We typically do the most radical changes, yes. because as you correctly said, I mean, small changes don't really help yeah. once you're stuck. Yes. And so actually, and uh, I was actually thinking whether you ever thought about a little bit of the history of science mm -hmm. and see whether this model works also oh, in the history of science. Kind of, yeah. Because, I mean, the history of science, I mean, the major, mm -hmm. probably, uh, changes that have happened when people got stuck, where I know people are something yeah. radically different from uh, things. I, I'm mm -hmm. just wondering whether, I mean, maybe there's no correlation at all, but scientists are not very different from any other human beings. I would think, I would <laughs> think there's, there's some, um, there's some analogies, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. Good point. They might be underperforming uh, uh, if they're too clever. And the other thing is that for, for grant applications, <laughs> and we try to do a, a statistics yeah, nice. for grant applications, and the people get them. Yeah, I get yeah. these questions every day from my colleagues, we want to see Peter in the first time, well, I didn't succeed two times, should I give up? I mean, it's, uh, it's actually that uh, people are very stressed about that. I mean, also the level of feedback that maybe we can get to uh, to this, you know, what you're saying feedback, this is also in, in basically in what we do every day, right? I mean, we send application grants about it. Does it also help them? So, at the, up until now, yeah. I have not put this in a brand application. I've put another idea in a brand mm -hmm. But I mean, it could be nice to actually this say very uh, It's an obvious thing because it's also, yeah. I mean, I could imagine that our rector would love to, 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 yeah. to know what is the, how do you call it, the, uh, the, the formula for uh, all of us getting grants, right? Yes. So, so does it help? I mean, if, if, you keep it, if you keep it to that, I'm sure you would love it. Yeah. If you examine the whole organization, yeah, no, also, I mean, no, but like also in terms of feedback, what kind of feedback yeah. can actually need to improve and things great. like that. I mean, uh, because we have it in office, right? Uh, so I so things like that, that should be done. But, I mean, uh, I still have a lot of uh, young colleagues that just came as assistant professor that are stressed. And they don't know exactly what kind of feedback they can get. And it's absolutely, I see what you're saying. They love to get the feedback. Yeah, because otherwise yeah. they get uh, distressed. And, uh, so they but how could you apply a model to this kind of thing? Well, I mean, it's a question you can check in terms of many times. For example, you, this you already showed right, the, the, the number of trials. Mm -hmm. How many trials you get before yes. you're giving up sending applications? People actually do that. Huh? I, I, think, I think this is a wonderful suggestion to be I don't know. Yeah, so uh, think about it and, and uh, whether. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. Whether or not uh, this is the right model to apply is part of why this is an interesting question. Yeah. So my question was just regarding this uh, that clever people didn't do <coughs> particularly well. Was that due to the cost? Because if you assume that people have intrinsic motivation for searching, which scientists do, then you, you probably get the opposite. So, right? I have another um, um, study with a social psychologist, uh, we have it, um, where we actually look at motivation as an additional yeah. parameter, and there we looked at, for instance, pre promotion prevention focus to uh, better understand also in terms of motivation and other parameters. All right. Any other questions? Uh, more questions? I think that's about it. Thanks a lot, Stephen.